Okay, who's presenting tonight? So on the left-hand side, uh, on his knees, on grass, praising grass like he does um, with all his fangled equipment is Darren from the Grounds Management Association, formerly the Institute of Groundsmanship. Uh, Darren is the regional pitch advisor um, and supports Kent. And I know there's clubs on here from other county FAs. It's great to have you on board. And um, Darren predominantly supports the South East. And like I've said, Kent, Darren's been brilliant for us um, over the two years that I've been in post. He's helped drive the standards of pitches in Kent forward. So we're really grateful to have him on board. And there's me looking happy as Larry on my on the mower. Um, and the reason I look happy is because my life has been taken over by pitches and facilities for the last two years as football development uh, manager for the Kent FA. And that is my remit. So if you do need help with funding, facilities and investment and pitch uh, improvement, then uh, feel free to get in touch. Look, at the moment, we all know the situation we're in, but we don't know what it's going to look like or how long it's going to go on for. So we are a community as football clubs and leagues and organisations, and it's about supporting each other. And that's exactly why we're here to support you. And maybe this workshop might distract you from what's going on and just give you a little bit of focus moving forward. But we understand the health and welfare of yourselves and your family must come above everything in these unprecedented circumstances. But we are here for you. We're still active. We're um, still trying to progress Kent football as best we can. So just lean on us if you need us. Um, staffing update from Kent FA um, for Kent affiliated leagues and clubs are online today. Look, postal correspondence, if you're trying to make contract with us via the post, it's probably not a great idea because the office has been closed for weeks. I think um, senior management have been in two or three times. But if you're looking for an urgent response, then get in touch via email or social media. Uh, at the moment, I 13 of our 18 staff have been furloughed. So... Um, there's five of us that are managing the Kent FA at the moment, so we're working from home, still get in touch with us, we're still picking up emails and trying our best to support our community in the game. On the back of this tonight, I will send you through uh, any resources we talk about, I will send you a copy of the slides and I will send you a link to the recording as well, so you can pick that up. We are facing new challenges within the role. Um, one, if I'm pitches and facilities and I can't go out and see them pitches, it's very difficult for me to progress them projects at the moment. But we are trying to get as much in place. So when we can go back out and be active, we're on the front foot and ready to go. We have got personal challenges and illnesses, the same as everyone else. We've had staff with uh, symptoms that are self-isolated and we're also down to five staff as well. So we do understand the challenges that uh, the modern world is facing at the moment. But we remain, as ever, passionate about supporting our community and our game moving forward. So, again, keep in touch, keep leaning on us however you best need us. We will try and help you. Um, you kindly, when you registered for this workshop, you kindly submitted questions. Um, so we will try and go through these questions at the end. I've tried to put them all together in one bubble. So if your question's there, you probably don't need to ask it because I will touch on it again at the end. So... They're the questions that we will be touching on the end. If you've got anything in addition, then uh, you can either use uh, type your question in the chat box and I'll try and pick that up. Or if the chat box option is not there, because as, as I said, it's temperamental, then do drop me an email and I can um, pick that up as well or try my best. I'm trying to multitask between managing the room, managing the slides to Darren. So if I do miss anything, uh, I apologise now. But I will pick it up at a later date, even if it's me or Darren touching base with you and trying to ask your, answer your questions moving forward. Um, quite a lot of you mentioned about funding and pitches and facility investment. Uh, I, I won't touch on that too much now because I delivered a workshop last Wednesday for about an hour. It wasn't just me rambling for an hour. You'll be glad to know it was 50-50 between me and Sophie Ward, who works at Kent Sport who done half hour presentation on top tips for um, writing applications and funding bids, whereas my half hour was about what funding is available. When I send out the resources for this workshop, I will also send out the slides for last Wednesday and also uh, the recording. So if you are interested in what funding is available at the moment, you can access that recording. Again, you can always email me if you've got specific questions. There is some good news. It's not all doom and gloom at the moment in football. Um, and this isn't an ego of me or boasting or anything like that, because I certainly hasn't come out of my wallet 
Um, and I'm not the main driver. It's the clubs and leagues and the football foundation. But within the two years and being been in post, we've managed to attract in over £3.1 million worth of grant offers. And that equates to just under £7 million worth of project value. So there are lots of good um, investments going on in Kent. We're still really keen to support you. So if you have got aspirations, if you have got projects in mind, do reach out to us. Um, and already in 2000, um, sorry, that should be 2020, 2020, we've already had 380k already in, in grant offers. Um, and since January, we've had £34,000 worth of grant offers for new or replacement goalposts. So if you're planning for the season ahead, new and replacement goalposts funding is still available. Um, it's the easiest funding application you will ever do. It takes approximately about three minutes so if you, if you need new goalposts, if you've got new teams, new pitches coming through, then that is really um, an application you should be putting in for 75% of the, the total cost of the goalposts. And since the Kent FA closed four weeks ago, we've still been getting grant offers. So the Football Foundation is still processing grants and we've had 201k in in grant offers since we closed. So we're still very active. Pitch improvement, um, the program in Kent, we're really proud of it. And it's it has in it is a key topic of mine all the time because we understand in Kent that poor pitches contribute uh, to the love of the game and lack of the love of the game. And once that love of the game goes, we lose our players, we lose our referees and our coaches because they just want a positive experience. Um with Darren's support and the support of our support pitch advisor, we've managed to carry out 313 pitch improvement assessments. So the pitch improvements assessments are clubs reach out to us or organisations who want to improve their pitches. We carry out a visit. Uh, we produce a report which has detailed recommendations in it, accustomed to your budget, and uh, hopefully we can support you with making use of the budget you have available, the machinery and the manpower that you might have there to really push forward and improve your pitches. And then the main plan is after 12 months, we revisit that pitch and hopefully see an improvement. And then that's what contributes to our targets. We have been working with four local authorities, which are uh, Medway, Canterbury and Dover. I've had their pitch assessments. We also really got a good partnership with Swale Borough Council. We were due to carry out the pitch assessments at the end of March, but for obvious reasons, we couldn't do that. But we are ready to go. So that's really keen. So um, key to us improving the pitches because we understand how many pitches come under local authority and how many pitches they're in charge of maintaining. We recognised on the back of these pitch improvement reports that 100% um, of Kent reports anyway were leading uh, to recommendations of decompaction. So the pitches were getting compact by footfall uh, and machinery on top, which was compacting the ground, which was then preventing good growth and improving the pitches. So the Kent FA invested £30,000 of its own money. So that money that we talk about of what do you do with our fines and affiliation money, well, we invested it in something that we thought was key, which was a verti drain equipment to put on the back of a tractor to then help with that decompaction. Um, we've got a local business in Bourne to Garden who carry out that work, maintain that machinery for us at a competitive rate for Kent clubs. So Kent clubs or organisations, we're looking for that decompaction, understand that they've got someone that we trust, we know and we've invested in. And since uh, the turn of the year, sorry, since December, we've had 232K confirmed if, if, towards pitch improvement services. So that's about going above and beyond to what all you already do. There's funding there available for you. Uh, you need a pitch assessment. So if you haven't got one already, then um, if you're a Kent based club, then make sure you book in with me and we can get it done as soon as we're allowed to. If you're not a Kent affiliate club, then make sure that you reach out to your appropriate county FA and get that assessment booked in so they can carry it out. The, the assessment rating needs to be uh, basic or below for you to qualify for that funding. So the sooner you get the assessment and find out what grants are available, the better. And already I've done 313 pitch uh, improvement assessments. We've, we've completed 96 pitches um, revisits and they've been confirmed as improved. So we are moving in the right direction. We've taken baby steps at the moment to get to that 222 improved pitches again, but we think we're, we're well on our way now. There's just a little bit, I'm not going to give you a sales pitch, it's the wrong environment, it's the wrong time, but 
if you do want some detail on the services that Born to Garden offer, then I can send you the uh, the flyer through. They're the company that that we've teamed up with. That they're our, our approved provider when it comes to pitch improvement. But now's not the time to go through that because there's more important things going on. Um, now I'm going to pass you over to Darren, who I've already introduced. So Darren, are you are unmuting yourself. I am, mate. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. All good. Lovely job. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. Um, shall I just say to you, Lee, when I want you to skip through? Yes, please, mate. Okay, yeah, so... Sorry, Darren, you just need to unmute yourself again. Oh, I don't know what happened there. Sorry about that. Is that okay? All good, mate, all good. Yeah, carry on through then for me, Lee. Right, good evening, everybody. Um... Before we get into the main elements of this section, uh, I'd like to bring your attention to the most important points, really. Uh, you'll see on this slide two links. Please make a note of them and in your own time, access them and understand them. This will be sent out to all of you, I'm sure, by Lee. So uh, please familiarise yourselves. The first is a link to the government website which will give you all the information that you need to know about the coronavirus, how to protect yourselves and how to protect others, uh, and lots of other really useful links. The second is a link to the GMA website, uh, the Grounds Management Association website, formerly the IOG. And this is a link which will be more specifically a page that details guidance in relation to this current situation. So whether you're employed, whether you're self-employed, whether you're a volunteer, you will find information on here is going to be really helpful to you. So please do read all of that and understand it. Uh, before deciding upon any form of maintenance or operation that we're about to discuss, you're going to need to familiarise yourself with these to see if it is suitable to do so. And that information that is on those links is valid as of uh, 15th of April. So that's today's date. And it probably will change at some point. But just so you know, 15th of April, that is when that information was valid. Switch on then, please, Lee. So what we're going to try and cover tonight, we're going we're gonna to have a look at what may happen to football playing services and the soils beneath, should they be left alone for any lengthy period. We're going to touch on what maintenance is recommended to consider undertaken at this time of year and also what works can or should be carried out as soon as play can resume. So let's start with what everyone thinks is the most simple thing that we all do, and that's mowing, cutting the grass. But there's a few little uh, hints and tips that we can all take from mowing to make sure that we do it properly. To be honest with you all, if it's not being played on at the moment, then the suggested height of cut, if you're able to, is 40 to 50 mil. Um, why would you do that? Well, it doesn't really need to, there's no player experience that you have to, to adhere to. So uh, there's no match height that you have to think about. Um, the increased height will actually result in the grass being under a lot less stress and a lot more drought tolerant. It will be slightly more of an open sward, so in other words, less thick, and that will reduce disease pressures, less humidity among the leaves, and it will encourage greater root growth as more leaf means more food, uh, more opportunity for photosynthesis. So when you actually do manage to get out and cut, or if, if you are able to cut, um, we always stick to a rule of a maximum of a third off at any one time. I'm sure that any of you guys that have been on any of my workshops you'll hear me say that or you're probably aware of that anyway maximum of a third off at any one time if you can cut once a week brilliant and if we do happen to get a cold snap i know it doesn't look like it at the moment but stranger things have happened or indeed a drought uh frequency of cutting could be reduced uh always try and cut in dry conditions and avoid the full heat of the day is uh, is good advice so what may happen if you are not able to cut your grass at all? Well, quite obviously, the grass will grow very tall. Uh, the surface will become very thin. The grass plant will try and set to seed 
and this will result in an even thinner surface. So it will be a challenge to get the surface back into a suitable playing condition when we start playing football again. We're going to touch on that a little bit later on in the presentation. If you were happen, if you happen to come back to a to an overgrown field, we'll have a chat about how we can deal with that. So next slide, please, Lee. So having a little look at the control or removal of thatch. So thatch, quite simply, is a layer of dead or dying organic matter that's predominantly found just above the soil profile, all tangled up in the roots and the, all tangled up in the uh, sward of the grass plant. Um, a little bit of thatch here is actually quite good, maybe a couple of mil, because it's good for the players, adds a bit of a cushion. But any more than that, you really need to be doing something about it. Uh, chances are when you go back, if it hasn't been touched for a long time, you may have quite a large thatch layer. But also chances are if you've been playing a lot of football before, a lot of that thatch may have been kicked out and uh, it would not be a problem. But if you think about what a thatched roof does on a house, it keeps the water out. So if you've got problems with drainage on your pitches and you find that you've got a really large thatch layer, then that's definitely something that you need to think about dealing with. Now, you can deal with this in a few ways. Um, one of my favourite tools was always a surface groomer, which I don't know if any of you have seen them, but uh, from a tractor mounted perspective, it's basically a giant springbok rake, the little green rakes that you use in your garden. And it drags through the surface and into that thatch layer, disturbs a lot of that debris that you want to get rid of. Uh, but do be aware that you need to have the ability to then suck all of that up once you've disturbed it, because it will. It's amazing how many, how much stuff you can bring up just from raking. Um, you want to do that in a few directions just to disturb it and get rid of a lot of that thatch. Another way of doing it is using a chain harrow or um, uh, a verticutter unit. Uh, scarifying is another option, but it is quite aggressive. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful with using that. So if you've got the ability to surface groom or chain harrow, that is that is definitely a good option for you guys. Um, it's always recommend re recommended to do that uh, or be cautious when the weather is hot and dry. Um, so yeah, that's one of the elements tonight. If you want to keep going, Lee. Lee spoke about this a little bit earlier with um, with Kent's investment uh, aeration stroke decompaction uh it's probably aeration and decompaction are the two most important things for you guys to consider and if you haven't really got the money to do anything else we're finding as lee said 100 percent of these pitches need spiking or need aerating um if it's the only thing that you can afford to do then that's what you should be doing in my opinion uh, if that's all if that's all the money you've got um, the ideal time to decompact is you're looking early spring or late autumn so you're sort of October November February March but again a lot of it is judgment so it's it's down to conditions don't just look in your day diary and see that you did it at that time um, we may have missed the boat a bit now with it being April and the weather changing but if you were able to spike in February, March, it's really going to help you when you come to doing any renovation work or getting some seed in the ground, because during that during that period, the ground probably will be too hard to spike. But those deeper time holes will be down there to help with your grass growth and help with your nutrient uptake and all of the good things that you need to happen when you do aerate. So. It improves the soil with gaseous exchange, so it gets basically it gets rid of the bad stuff and lets the good stuff in, quite simply. Um, infiltration of water, nutrient uptake, deeper rooting and drought stress tolerance. Uh, just to touch as well, there's different machines that are available depending on the type of soil you've got. We can go into a little bit more detail of that separately, but if it is something that you're thinking about doing, it's, a, it's, it's really, really recommended as one of the best practices you could do to your pitches. Next one, please, Lee. So fertilising, um, it may be, in all honesty, in many cases, 
there's there may not be a need to be applying fertilizer because the grass is going to be growing quite well quite naturally on its own what you'll probably need to do well what you'll definitely need to do is basically look at your grass plant your grass is your, your plant is always trying to tell you something just by the way it looks so if it's looking hungry then yeah chances are it will need a bit of a feed um if it's looking a bit poorly maybe there's a bit of disease there that you need to deal with but it's always trying to tell you something um if not a fertilizer then you will probably be moving into the time of year where you'll be looking at dealing with your weeds which is on the next slide um fertilizing it's not going to need to recover from wear and tear because we haven't been smashing it to pieces um bear in mind as well if you do put some kind of feed down then it is going to cause a bit more maintenance because you're encouraging it to grow so you're going to have to keep on the grass cutting so you have to balance that out as well uh, once we get back to normal and we've got our mowing under control then it would probably be a good time to assess the need for treatments again and action accordingly. We try and keep it relatively simple when through pitch improvement. We, we tend to stick to uh, control release fertilizer twice a year because we're dealing with grassroots clubs. But please be aware that there are lots of wonderful products on the market and you're perfectly advised and within your right to talk to any fertilizer supplier or distributor and get some advice um, and another thing I'd always recommend you to do is to get a soil analysis a soil analysis done and understand the soil analysis and a fertilizer supplier can help you with that and it could it could help you tailor your feeding program for your plant if you're at that level um, so that's your fertilizing sorted Lee so as I said your main issue is potentially going to be weeds um the weeds will appear when you've got bare patches quite simply so i suppose the best thing to do is to minimize the bare patches which isn't always easy because some of us are paying 60 to 70 games a year and it's it's not quite as straightforward as that so we may suddenly have a a bit of a weed invasion if it's a significant problem uh, the way that I always advise people to do, you go down sort of three roads, you go cultural, mechanical, and then your last resort is chemical. So we want to go chemical last if we can't manage it any other way. If you are forced to go down the chemical route, then an application of selective herbicide can be applied, but it has to be done by a suitably qualified person. If you're not suitably qualified, then please do not go anywhere near it. Um, this operation is normally done between May and September, really when the weeds are actively growing. One little bit of advice you could do as well to save you a bit of money. Um, we used to wait for the clover to come through before we decided to spray because we found that the clover always tended to come through last. So sometimes if you spray too early, you, uh, you end up spraying again because the clover hasn't really properly gone and established. So that could help you all. Um, and again, some good products on the market. So speak to a distributor. Um, and as with all operations, as we mentioned on the first slide with all of this, consider whether this is an essential practice during this period of restricted movement. Familiar, familiarize yourself with the documents and go from there. Let's move on then, please, Lee. So where possible and where resources permit, take time to repair those areas that have always caused issues. Now we've all got them, whether it be a particular goal mouth that's right next to the changing rooms or right near the nearest floodlight or wherever, easiest access. That one goal mouth that gets smashed to pieces and we always struggle to fix it because we haven't got the time and we haven't got enough time for the seed to germinate and establish before it gets kicked out. So this could be a real idea time to, to get that done, if possible. Um, I sometimes go to sites where people have got problem areas elsewhere in the pitch. And they always sort of say, you know, how are we going to fix this area? How are we going to fix this area? And, and one of the bits of advice I always give to them is 
just just treat it like a goal mouth, you know, just pretend it's a goal mouth just in a different part of your pitch. And the, the methodology of fixing your goal mouth, and don't get me wrong, I've had really good successes with goal mouths and I've had complete and utter failures. It can be a bit of a skill to repair your goal mouths. Um, I've got quite a nice little uh, little bit of methodology if anybody wanted it sent out, just a bit of advice to actually get a decent result with them. You may have goal mouths that are raised and you may have time and the ability to to sort that out one of those areas that you've always wanted to fix um it's typically like a, a, a light renovation basically it's a mini renovation in a, in a localized area that consists of hand forking you might use a machine for a larger area you might want to put a little bit of feed down a bit of overseeding top dressing the thin areas level it off and uh if you are able to cover it with germination sheets, then that's fantastic. Uh, keep it regularly watered to aid germination and establishment. 10, 12 days tops, you'll see the grass shoots coming through your germination sheet and that's the time to take them up. As soon as you see those shoots coming through the sheet, take them up, but be careful to take them up quite slowly because I've done it in the past where I've pulled it up too quick and it's pulled out a load of the new seedlings. So germination sheets are brilliant. If you can get hold of them, I definitely recommend sorting that out uh, if you've got the time to do so now. Um, re-turfing, I often get asked about re-turfing and a lot of the time, a lot of the time I tend to advise against it because from experience, they don't tend to last too long before they get kicked out. They can be an expensive way of fixing things. Uh, but if we're not going to be playing or if, the, if there is that big break between um use there may be a, a a longer period of time for it to establish but obviously again if guidelines permit so turfing could be an option but i was always a bit old school i liked to just i like to just fix it from scratch myself but it is an option moving on to irrigation now and uh, i'm sure that all of you grassroots clubs have got brilliant irrigation with fantastic bar pressure and you can walk whenever you like well i know that you haven't so i do feel your pain but if you do have the option to be able to water your pitches uh just be a little bit mindful of of when you choose to do this um a lot of people still think that watering your pitches in the middle of the day is a good idea because it's really hot it's really hot i need to get some water out there well you really are wasting your time and you're wasting water and you're wasting money so the advice is always to sort of do your irrigation at the coolest part of the daytime. So first thing in the morning and sort of late afternoon, early evening was always a good time to stick the sprinklers on for a little while, a couple of hours. Uh, don't over irrigate because too much water will affect the turf grass growth. Um, it can also affect the soil conditions and actually to the extent where you're causing compaction by putting too much water down. Always try and water uniformly. Um, try and give it as much uh, water in the fairest way possible is how I always kind of work it out. Um, I know it's not going to be massively possible for a lot of you guys, but if you're certainly if you're doing localised spot repair, you may have the opportunity to get out there and uh, give those areas a little bit of a sprinkle. Um, and if it is uh, limited, then again, just focus on those areas that are weakest and ones that you've tried to repair. Thank you, Lee. Next one. So we touched on this earlier. So how can I get my playing surface back to a fit for play condition should a ban on play be lifted? So you've, you've not been able to get out there and do anything at all. You go back to a massively overgrown field and I know what it's going to be like. There's going to be pressure on you guys to get a pitch up and running almost immediately because as soon as the people are allowed to play football again, they're going to want to start playing straight away. And that's going to be a real challenge. Oh, it really is going to be a real challenge because we just can't click our fingers and have a pitch ready. Um, it's going to be it's going to be quite tough, but depending on how much time you've got available to yourself, the first thing you're going to have to consider is getting that grass height under control. So if it is too long, which likelihood is, likelihood is it will be, um, you may need to consider scarification. You may need to consider flail, mow, flail mowing. 
uh, removing the thatch, the surface debris, unwanted grasses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, do have a good walk over your pitches before you try and do anything as well when we're allowed to do something because you never know what's going to be on there uh, and you don't want to go smashing up your machine by driving over some foreign object so it's always good practice just to walk your pitches to clear off any uh, clear off any debris if you are looking to cut and clear in this way because the grass is literally out of control then do be aware of uh having to get rid of any of these cuttings um as we know a lot of these recycling depots at the moment are closed so that isn't going to be an option anyway but when it comes down to it have it in the back of your head that you're going to have to get rid of this you're going to have to get rid of the clippings um, and that may have an impact on cost for yourselves once you've got the grass height back down and you can analyze it a little bit more you may need have you may have the opportunity to use your chain harrow rough side down try and sort out some of the levels try and create a bit of a seed bed um try and get rid of some of that unwanted debris that we mentioned about it would be an, a really good time then to to analyze whether it's suitable for a selective herbicide through a qualified contractor but again follow the cultural mechanical and then chemical route before deciding upon that and obviously it has to fit in with um the timings for your next game so be aware of that try and get on top of your mowing as quickly as possible so introduce a regular mowing regime and if you're if you're able to and you've got the time overseeding is going to be key um three directions at least i tend to, i used to go three directions and then another couple of passes in my high wear or just uh, going out manually sort of putting a bit more seed out and working it in um with a little true loop um the ideal way of doing this is with a drill seeder and it's about 30 to 40 grams per square meter you're looking at about eight to ten bags of seed to do a full pitch um you can sometimes get away with a little bit less if you're only doing through the middle or your highway areas but you're roughly looking at about eight to ten bags so that's always good good advice maybe maybe sort of purchase 12 and then you can keep two in the shed and then over time you'll save up a, a, enough for for more sort of um, uh, better spot repairs throughout the season if need be if you're able to do that um, and then you might want to consider a pre-germination fertilizer at the same time uh, it all just depends on the condition of the pitch and what what you feel is necessary to get it back up and running uh, if if it comes to needing more advice on this or, or I haven't covered anything that you specifically want to know about and we don't have time for the question, then um, myself and Lee are always available um, if you wanted to get in touch with us after that. OK, Lee, next one. Just to recap one more time, this is my final slide, guys. So opening the floor up to questions. I know I've mentioned it a few times, but I can't stress enough how vitally important both of these links are for you to understand. If you have any thought about any of the things that you're thinking of doing before you do anything read these two sections and work out if it is suitable because that will help you make your decision and i can't stress it enough so thank you very much for that uh, hopefully i've covered everything you wanted to uh, to go through did you want to do these questions now lee yeah we'll do thank you darren that was brilliant um your knowledge and experience is superb and we greatly appreciate it in Kent. We just go through, I've got a few questions that come in through email that uh, I'm either going to deal with around funding or anything like that. Um, if we just go through the ones on screen and then I'll come to the ones I've got via email. So, uh, Darren, what are the chances of seed germination without top dressing? Uh, okay. Um, thank you for that one. So uh, the key to this really is the application of the seed um, you need to ensure that there is suitable seed to soil contact so that's the key element really use of a disc seeder as mentioned earlier is recommended as you can you can set the depth yourself uh, for the plant in depth that you need for that particular cultivar so if you're dealing with rise which is what we probably are mainly then you're looking at about four to six mil um, some cultivars can be planted deeper, some grass types specifically want to be at a certain depth. 
So it's always good, always worth double checking. But the disc seeder's really good because it does get right into the ground at that depth that you want. Um, in relation to the top dressing, the top dressing is ideal for your levels. So it, mainly to sort that out. Um, and it provides that added little bit of protection for the seed. But it is still possible to obtain the growth without top dressing as long as there is suitable tilfing of the soil and you are literally planting with the disc seeder. If you just, you could have the most expensive and best grass seed in the world, but if you just chuck it out onto a gold mouth, it's you, all you're doing is feeding the birds. You're not actually going to do anything. So it's all about the application. But if you can afford to have the top dressing as well, brilliant. The other thing I would mention as well, the, the condition of the pitch when you actually use the implement is really important. It has to be soft enough for the grooves to go into the ground. If it is too hard, it makes it that added a little bit more difficult. Um, but yeah, that's that's really the best way to answer that question. I hope that answers it for you anyway, whoever sent that one in. Thank you, Darren. So on to the next one. Uh, how can drainage, and there was a little bit in there, so it was how can drainage and possibly lack of it and proper irrigation and lack of proper irrigation affect the playing surface? Okay. Um, so a lack of drainage uh, can be one of the reasons that your water in the soil cannot be removed away. Um, but everything that sits above your drain runs needs to be in working order through good maintenance and having a decent soil in the first place. So you can have the most all singing, all dancing drainage system in the world, but if everything above it is 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 like a road, it's not going to work. Um, in terms of irrigation um, and in terms of the playability, uh, the irrigation can make the surface slicker. Uh, it can also soften the ground to reduce impact injury. Um, in terms of growth for new seed, uh, it's required once germination has begun um, to keep the plant alive and continue to grow. Um, as said before, always remember to water during the coolest part of the day. Um, watering during the heat is a waste of time. But um, yeah, is that enough in terms of the playability side of things? I guess uh, it's it's more it's it's more down to um, in terms of drainage. We always we always advise improving your maintenance first before you even consider having a drainage system because they can be really expensive things to maintain. So another way that your drainage, if it's a drainage system, could impact on the playability is if you're not topping up your drain runs which are needed to happen and costs money, they sink. And I've seen it happen. I think me and Lee have both seen it happen and it can really become dangerous. So you can have something, you're trying to do the right thing by having this drainage system there, but you can end up really causing your pitch some problems if you don't maintain and sustain it. So hopefully that answers that uh, fully. Yeah, thank you, Darren. And just from our point of view, the Football Foundation does provide funding for drainage um it's normally on a 75 percent uh basis it depends how uh the total cost of the project um and how you, quickly we can escalate it but we do get quite a lot of clubs coming to us saying we've got a problem with drainage but actually when we carry out the pitch assessment and they follow through with darren's recommendations it normally solves quite a lot of the issues if um the recommendations and darren don't work then to progress with a funding application to the football uh, foundation you would need to carry out an agronomist report and they can cost quite a bit of money to do that initial bit of work so you just need to be aware of it isn't as easy as just saying we we need drainage we're going to go out and get it through the football foundation there's a few more barriers that you need to go through because we need to ensure that one drainage is needed first and foremost and two it's going to be value for money if they do invest in it so thanks Daz. thanks to going on to that uh making your money go further what to prioritize uh what do you do if you've got a limited budget um yeah okay so in terms of limited budget well the first thing that you would need to do is understand how much you've got and understand what the pitch needs and understand what those priorities are so we spoke a little bit earlier about how important the decompaction and aeration works are um 
to kind of give you an idea if you're if you're a one pitch site a 111 v 11 pitch site to to give it a good spike twice a year you'd be looking at around 700 quid 800 quid depending on how far the bloke's got to come and depending really how much he wants to charge you so uh, it's always good shopping around also use the link that uh, Kent has the partnership that he has to get the price um so for 700 pounds you could do what we are seeing as probably the, the the biggest win for grassroots clubs to actually get some more games played you're not it's not going to turn you into Wembley don't get me wrong but you will probably see 15 20 percent improvement but you will undoubtedly see a difference that season and we've we've gone to clubs where they've started doing this and a few other little bits and bobs, but not thrown a fortune at it. And we have had examples where they are the only club in that borough who, who played football on that particular day when everywhere else was flooded. And that was, that's a really, that's really good feedback for us. So it is something that is massively helpful uh, for you guys, um, it must obviously be done properly and professionally. It must be done at the right time of year, which we've mentioned about, in the right conditions to have maximum effect. Um, also, in terms of saving you guys money, in terms of consumables, you may find that you can order more seed and fertiliser than you use during renovation, as we spoke about, to get a bit of a price break and then save the rest for a rainy day. Well, not a rainy day, but you know what I mean? Uh, if you have enough storage. So <clears throat> there's also the option for some of you clubs to talk to each other if you're very close and <clears throat> buy, uh, bulk buy, store, um, and save a few quid that way. That's really helpful. Speak to your suppliers and see what they can do for you. Uh, most of them are very, very good at, giving you the right advice so just speak to those guys and if you also if you wanted to speak to me that's fine cheers Darren. thank you just on while we're on aeration uh we've had a question coming from tracy at she and east youth uh we understand that february or march is ideally the best time to do aeration if you couldn't do it then because of the weather it is or anything like that so we had a wet really wet feb and march is it still worth doing now or do we wait till october and november well, we're, we're sat on the 15th of April and there have been some years where I have been able to do it, but it is all dependent on the weather. We have had a very, very dry spell, so we may have missed the boat. Um, obviously, this has to be done in conjunction with all of the rules that we've talked about, but if we were looking at doing it now, um, potentially not. I'm not sure really what the forecast is for the rest of the month. But it's in answer to the question, um, you judge it on the condition. So you, you want the pitch to be soft enough for the time to enter the soil profile, but dry enough underneath for it to fracture the subsoil. That's the key. Uh, you also don't want to be doing anything too aggressive in terms of decompaction work, too close to the really hot weather. And I don't know what's happening with this weather. I mean, a couple of years we had snow in April, so... I don't really know what the long range forecast is saying, but if we if we suddenly go out and start spiking everywhere and then it gets really, really hot, you're going to run the risk of cracking. So, uh, yeah, in answer to the question, I would just judge it on the condition of the pitch and the weather. OK, hopefully that, yeah. that answers that question. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Darren. So this one you might have already covered is about how to improve soil for drainage and good growth. Yeah, again, your, decom your decompaction, but also it's the quality of soil, which is probably really important to understand. Uh, decompaction works always recommended, but the operation will vary on soil types. So there are different machines for different soils. Um, what's going to be key if, if your soil isn't necessarily desirable, in other words, if, if, you, if you're playing on a load of clay, um, introducing an, immediate, an ameliorating decent decent sands or medium coarse sand into the profile over time to improve the soil's characteristics uh, in other words the soil's ability to drain naturally will help uh, and then a combination of everything so spiking feeding seeding watering it will all impact on the health of the plant and all help towards drainage and good growth 
Brilliant. Thank you, Darren. And that probably leads on to the last one, which you've really touched on um, already. So it probably comes uh, how to deal with wet pitches probably comes to the preparation leading up to that wet period. But if you've got anything else to add on that. Yeah, it's the preparation. Um, the thing about the playing season, guys, and when the weather changes and we can't grow anything, the playing season is all about survival. You know, we, we try and get everything ready to go when things are growing and everything's right to do stuff. We do our spiking around our October, November time. We do our feeding. And we try and we try and get into a position to survive over that winter period where it gets smashed to pieces. And then we try and bring it all back again and bring it all back to life. But there are certain things that people are still doing. And I know I know what it's like because you look out the window and you think I've got to do something. But if, if anyone is still rolling their pitches and Lee knows how I feel about rollers, <laughs> if anyone is rolling their pitches, it is the one most detrimental thing that you can do to your pitch. And everyone, or people say, oh, it sorts my levels out. No, it doesn't. Oh, I had to do something. No, you didn't. But sometimes the best thing to do is nothing. But the ultimate best thing to do and the ground, the grounds person's best tool that they have in their shed is a fork. So rather than spend an hour sat down, rolling your pitch, go out for an hour with a fork and try and spike some areas that are struggling, try and replace some divots. And if you do that as many times as you jump on your roller, you will have a much better pitch and you'll, you won't be wasting your money when you go to spiking. So that's probably the, one of the best bits of advice I can give anyone really. Thanks, Darren. We almost went a pitch conversation without you getting angry about a roller. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was close. Um, I've <laughs> because just no one the... said that they rolled their pitches, so I was okay. <laughs> uh, I've just got uh, a question coming in from James at Elsa FC. With the recent change in weather, our pitches have gone from water log surface to bone dry in a couple of weeks, and now large cracks have appeared. How do you deal with these? Okay, so that sounds like a very common a uh, problem that we encounter, Lee, in terms of, I would imagine he's a very clay dominant pitch. Um, and we saw this a couple of years ago. It was, it, was, it was a real major problem for loads of people. So the best thing I can do, rather than go into it in too much detail, I've got a really good methodology of fixing that particular problem. So if you could send me that gentleman's email and I will send it over to them straight away or I could even give it to you to send out to the group if anyone's interested in seeing it. Yeah, that'd be great, Darren. If you could send that over to me and I'll add it to the email to go out with the recording and the slides, etc. so everyone's got it. Yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll make a note of that to send you. Brilliant. I'm just going to check my emails again and uh, the question box. It looks like we're all out of questions, mate. Um, so thank you for not only sharing your knowledge and experience, but huge thank you for giving up your evening tonight i know it's only an hour but your preparation in uh in the lead up to this has been spot on and i know we've had practice runs and we wanted to get it right so um on behalf of everyone on here tonight and ken football thank you for your time to to help improve the experience of everyone involved no that's fine mate and uh i would say that if anyone's got anything else um you've got my details or lee can send you my details uh so do get hold of me if, if you need any advice or any help with anything. I'll I'll, I'll be uh, I'll be around for a while. So brilliant. Yeah. Cheers, Darren. Thank you. And just before everyone signs off, and um, just some final thoughts from us. A bit of Jerry Springer this bit. Um, as Darren has already said, follow government guidance um, with everything we do. Make sure you're staying at home. Stay connected. Reach out to us if you can do. Follow the guidelines so we can get through this as uh, is safely and as quick as possible and um, we do have a ken of a covid19 page on our website so that's kenfa.com and um, that tells you everything that you need to know that's going on that's affecting football at the moment including safeguarding children to your leagues and clubs etc uh, stay in touch if you're facing some real hard challenges then look i'm only at the end of an email or we can arrange one of these calls and have a chat it doesn't have to be football you can just have a whinge at me if you want, just to get it off your chest. And share best practice. If you're doing something that's really good, let us know so we can share it with the rest of the Kenneth A community and everyone else. Uh, resources will follow. So the slides, the recording, um, the document Darren just spoke about. And I will also put a link in there for a questionnaire just to find out what you thought of tonight. Was it worthwhile? 
what would you like us to do another workshop on? So we've done one with leagues, adult leagues, youth leagues. We've done one on funding. We've done obviously done this one tonight. Um, so if there's anything else that you think clubs and leagues will benefit for, then do reach out to us and tell us. We do care. We're generally not just sitting on our backside. We want to help out Ken Football as safely and as um, proactively as possible. And a huge, huge thank you for for everyone that joined us tonight, for Darren, from the support from the Grounds Management Association, for everyone, every club, uh, groundsman, volunteer for coming on tonight. We really do appreciate you, your dedication and commitment to come on here tonight and giving up an hour to listen to me and Darren talk about grass is testament and shows how passionate you are. So uh, thank you for your time. Stay safe, stay connected. 